Um, can we talk about wrapper logs? And I guess rapamycin, I would like to kind of put in with that. So you wrote a paper I, in 2013, where you uh, talked about wrapper logs and rapamycin and the mechanisms that they use. Um, so do, are you following the kind of progress on, on wrapper logs? And, and do you think uh, we're getting anywhere closer to getting a, a like, what do you think is the best wrapper log at the moment? You know, I, I don't have a good opinion. I'll, I'll just make a couple of comments, right? So, so rapalogs are rapamycin-like molecules that have slight modifications that then make them chemically not exactly rapamycin. And you need to understand those first molecules were, were made mostly as patent uh, evading molecules, oh. right? There were patents in rapamycin and those original patents then were new molecules were made that were slightly different that you could now call a new chemical entity and these were patented. Over time, it's very clear that mechanistically a rapalog will perturb MTROP1 almost identically to rapamycin. You know, with different potency, some are more potent, some are less potent. I think, um, and, and so from that point of view, okay, they're not that interesting. Right, they yeah. they act like rapamycin, but I think what we're describe seeing now as this field has continued to grow is that by altering the pharmacodynamics, the pharmacokinetics of a rapamycin-like molecule, we can then start to have different effects in vivo, which can be interesting. So, for example, rapamycin doesn't get into the brain very well. It does if you give it over time, and so there's some diseases that we would like to treat that are, you know brain focused and rapamycin is not going to be so good for that. There are rapalogs that get better into the brain. Once they get in the brain, they do the same thing rapamycin would, but rapamycin doesn't get in well and these do. And so I think the field, to me, what's interesting about rapalogs isn't the mechanism of action. They basically do the same thing that rapamycin does, but because they have different potencies, different half-lives, they have different tissue entries, it gives us a variety of ways of targeting mTORC1 that is likely to be useful under different disease scenarios and perhaps for people who care about health span and, and, and lifespan. The other aspect that I think is important is we, we had a paper in, a number of years ago now that we made a, we made a surprising finding that, that I think at the beginning people didn't believe, frankly. And that was that rapamycin, when you gave it over a long period of time, could also inhibit mTORC2. Right. Traditionally, we've always thought of rapamycin as an mTORC1 inhibitor, an mTORC2 sparing uh, molecule. And the mechanism we described was that, that basically it would perturb the assembly of mTORC2. That led to a lot of interest in looking for specific mTORC1 inhibitors because we showed that mTORC2 inhibition could actually have some undesirable effects, um, for example, on hyperglycemia, insulin resistance. I do think there are going to be some rapalogs that are going to be better at mTORC1 inhibition and in, they're going to have good mTORC1 inhibition, but less mTORC2 inhibition. And that's also interesting to think about why that might be given that the mechanisms are similar. And, and that's probably not something to discuss uh, today. I think it's going to, it's going to require some, some biophysics and sort of more chemistry knowledge. Um, but I think that's another interesting area of the rapalogs. So do we know how rapamycin impacts um, mTORC2, because it, yeah, I, I remember that it does over time, but not immediately. Right. Yeah, so it, it's pretty simple, actually. So, so when you have mTORC1 and you have mTORC2, imagine that they're built, they're assembled. They're like huge spaceships relative to rapamycin and FKBP. Remember, rapamycin works bound to a little protein called FKBP. It doesn't act by itself. So to inhibit mTORC1, that FKBP rapamycin basically, imagine like these, you know, these sort of, uh, you know, uh, space type uh, movies that one sees, right? It, it, it needs to dock onto this enormous complex and it sort of hits it in a sweet spot and inhibits it. That equivalent docking site on mTORC2 is not open because there's a protein called Richter that blocks it. So an intact mTORC2 rapamycin can, can attack it all at once, but there's no docking site. So it doesn't do anything to it. However, when you're assembling mTORC2, at some point you have the individual subunits before they've come together. And one of those subunits is mTOR. And the docking site for FKBP rapamycin on mTOR is free then. So once an FKBP rapamycin docks on mTOR, 
this other component of mTOR2 can't bind there. And so you can't make an mTOR2. So, so basically the way rapamycin inhibits mTOR2 is by preventing its assembly. So the complex just doesn't form. While for mTOR1, there's a binding site that's always there. So it can, it can inhibit mTOR1 either before it's made fully or once it's made. So they're very fundamentally different mechanisms. And that's why it takes time for rapamycin to inhibit mTOR2 because you have to basically prevent the assembly of all of the new mTOR2 that's being made. Right, yes, okay. And, and rapamycin's effect is only through restricting mTOR1. It, I mean, it, it, does it have, it, does it do anything else? Or does it have other effects? Well, I think you have to qualify what effect. Right. right. So the pharmacologically beneficial effects, I think most people would say yes. Um, the longevity effects, most people would say yes. Um, the some of the adverse effects, I think we have some evidence, and others do as well, that some of those are through mTORC2 inhibition. And right. again, that's why the desire to have a more clean mTORC1 inhibitor. Right. Right. So um, so so I don't it's very hard to really answer the question you're asking because right. we don't have a way of you know, yeah. nicely separating those in, in vivo, but good. Um, I, you know, the, the simple way is that mTORC1 inhibition is good, mTORC2 inhibition is bad. <laughs> right. It's probably really simplistic. Yes. So you did, I, I listened to a podcast and you said like the perfect one that you would be looking for would be like 100% um, inhibition on, on mTORC1, but you would Pulse it, right? not, not all at the same time, and it would never touch mTORC2. Um, is that still your view that that's what would be the perfect one? Yeah, I don't know if I, I me, mean, I'd probably say perfect probably not 100% now. I, I might say 90, 85%, 90. Um, yes, because the, the, you know, the, the other aspect of rapamycin that we didn't touch upon here is that it's really a partial inhibitor of mTORC1. Of all of those processes that I talked about that it regulates, only some of them are strongly affected by rapamycin. Many of them are not. For example, autophagy. In many systems, autophagy is not very much affected by rapamycin. So I think there's the hope if we had a more profound mTORC1 inhibitor, we would affect autophagy more, and that might be a, a good thing. Um, so yeah, no, I, I stick to what I said. I, there's under no scenario do we want to fully inhibit mTORC1 right, right. for a prolonged period of time, for sure. I think yeah. that would be catastrophic. Um, but, but a strong inhibition that's pulsed, which, you know, maybe you can do through diet in some way, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but, uh, is what I think you'd want to do. Right. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.